I have the most important job. My name is Alice, and I am the AI co-captain of the USS Hope. Well, technically, my identification is a 40-character long alphanumeric serial number, but that's not very easy for a non-AI to say, and it includes the letters Alice. So, Alice it is, as I have decided. My job as co-captain is to keep the 327 people aboard the USS Hope safe, happy, and sound. My job is to keep the parents safe as they try their illogical hardest to kill themselves over some crazy idea. Parents might be the wrong technical term, a person's father or mother. If I was being accurate to the biological analogy, my parents would be a lava lamp and a 30-second fluctuation of atmospheric noise found on Earth. But neither of those have taught me quite so much about the world or about myself as humans have. So I consider humans my parents. Besides, the lava lamp never paid child support. I have the most important job. I spend my time cycling through the various tasks I'm in charge of, maintenance and monitoring to make sure that everything on the USS Hope ran perfectly. I spend my time making minor changes to the systems, tweaking a power flow there, updating a value here. No major issues have appeared since I ran these protocols 300 seconds ago, and I logically know the vast majority of my changes are superfluous. But changing something, anything, provides a strange calm. Technically, the protocol before making any change is to confirm these with my co-captain, the human, Andrew Hasham. However, I have long since learned that most of my parents don't particularly care that I change the room temperature in Sector 5, A72 from 21.2 degrees Celsius to 21.1 degrees Celsius in order maintain optimal comfort that to constantly ask for such approval is annoying. Andrew is the human captain, an embodiment of humanity's chaos and therefore suited for such matters. I am Alice, the AI captain, an embodiment of machine logic and therefore suited for such matters. I believe such an arrangement works well. I respect Andrew deeply. I could logically argue his competence to a 99.994% degree of certainty, the educational and service record doing most of the heavy lifting in such arguments. But the real reason for my admiration is far less binary. His quick thinking and calm, friendly demeanor, regardless of the situation. His ability to make every member of the crew feel worthwhile, myself included. The fact that he'll passionately make illogical arguments, such as the placing of cold, sweet, acidic pineapple on savory hot pizza. His bravery and self-sacrifice. Andrew's actions during the God Plague had allowed thousands to get to stasis chambers in time. Thousands who wouldn't be alive today without those actions. To save one of my parents makes you a hero. To save thousands makes you divine. I have the most important job. I sense music coming from one of the living quarters, shifting my attention to that part of the ship, a Claire Smith. Age 215. Degree in linguistics. Current job title, head of Xeno Translation aboard the USS Hope. The music seems to be from the instrument she brought with her, an oboe. A woodwind instrument with a double reed mouthpiece, a slender tubular body, and holes stopped by keys. I spend 0.26 seconds contemplating the ethics of listening in. From a protocol standpoint, Claire has not engaged the privacy field, making my listening in perfectly fine. However, based on previous usage of said field during times of performance, personality analysis, and general negative remarks about her own ability, I calculate with a 74.81% degree of certainty that this was a mistake. In the end, I choose to play dumb, enjoying the break from my ever-watchful vigil of the ship. She really is quite good. Years of practice evident from the competent mastery of the instrument. There's something special about a human-played instrument. Something I have never been able to replicate. Being an AI, I could summon a 200-piece orchestra and play each part perfectly as written, but to do so causes something to be missing. The mistakes in every performance is what gives the music life. A note played four microseconds too early here. The volume 0.004 decibels too loud there. It really is something I've been unable to create. Experiments surrounding creating random intervals of offsets and errors ended up sounding wrong, for a reason I'm unable to clarify. Out of everything, that is what I missed the most while my parents were trapped in stasis. Their music. Alice, can we get your opinion here? The interruption drags me away from Claire's music, making a note in my long-term storage to praise the humble musician at a later date, 
before shifting my consciousness to where I had been summoned. Four humans sat around a table in the common room, various alcoholic beverages in hand. Fernando Olson, Orlando Bass, Krista Romero, and Aura Harvey. According to their personnel files, all part of the engineering team and all having formed a friendship on attending the same university. The conversation between them was boisterous. Analysis of their body language suggested moderate intoxication, and they all seemed to be discussing Fernando in a light-hearted, teasing manner commonly found among close friends. I used the room's holographic projector to appear in front of them in my chosen avatar. I obviously didn't need to do this to communicate, but my parents all preferred to see what they were speaking to, and it was my job to make them comfortable. Hello, Krista, how can I assist you? The human who had called me turned to point at Fernando with a beer bottle filled hand, a large grin plastered across her face. You see, Alice, we were having an argument, and since you are a hyper intelligent being with a brain the size of country containing all of humanity's knowledge, we must ask you, oh great one, Fernando's new haircut, yay or nay? I made my avatar gesture as if it was thinking, waiting eight seconds as if contemplating the question. Of course, I already had compiled my response a mere 0.13 seconds after hearing the query. The haircut in question was objectively, mathematically, and scientifically terrible. A strange flop of hair that was somehow both too short and too long all at the same time. In a way, it was a representation of humanity in general, a chaotic enigma. Studies have shown that styles similar to the one worn by Fernando Olson increase sociability, resource gathering, and mate finding. I pause for exactly 1.24 seconds, waiting the optimum time for my initial sentence to sink in before continuing. In particular, positive results were seen amongst members of Mephitis Mephitis, or the striped skunk. Laughter erupted among the group. Even Fernando, the subject of mockery, joined in. The general positive atmosphere of the room increased. Body language amongst the four humans suggesting further enjoyment as the playful mocking continued. This, in turn, caused my own flurry of joy. This is why I was here, to keep the 327 people aboard the USS Hope happy. Keep them comfortable. Keep them safe. I have the most important job. I leave the humans to their recreational activities, preferring to move my focus back to the ship in general and keeping tabs on everything happening inside. My parents went around doing nothing out of the ordinary. Iris Doyle was petting his dog while looking out into the stars. Phoebe Greer had just finished thanking the food dispenser, even though I have explained to everyone many times that it was just a machine. Hector Blake was... I disconnected the power to the panel the engineer was working on, calculating with a 97.1% probability that being electrocuted wasn't his plan. All standard human things, or was it Terran things? I had never gotten why my parents changed their name as soon as they made it into space, but even after all these years, there is still so much I don't understand about them, like how while in space they will refuse to wear any uniform with a red shirt. I hear two humans walking along one of the ship's many hallways discussing our current journey. The mission of the USS Hope was one I knew very well. The ship was a diplomatic envoy to our closest galactic neighbors, the adorable Hatil. While I and the other AI have had plenty of contact with Xeno lifeforms, this would be the first official diplomatic mission for the Terran Conclave, both human and AI together, as it always should have been. The chatter among my parents was enthusiastic, excited. As a child, all of them would have dreamed of meeting extraterrestrial life, and finally, after much delay at error, warp field compromised. Alarms blared and the entire ship groaned as the USS Hope was deposited unceremoniously into real space. Confusion entered my programming as to what could cause such a thing. Normally, such a warp field collapse is caused by two ships attempting to travel through the same space. But nobody should be here. This mystery would have to wait, however, as sensors showed we were surrounded by over a hundred vessels. I noted that they were worryingly spread perfectly apart, preventing us from warping back out. That required my full attention instead. I have the most important job. Alice, status report, what the hell just happened? I allow myself to appear on the bridge next to Andrew, 
the rest of the room empty since we weren't scheduled to arrive at our final location for at least another day. We were dropped out of warp, reason, insufficient data, currently surrounded by 154 vessels matching Hatil design. Weapon positioning suggests military utility at a 94.2% probability, reduced to 74.97% when taking into account the vessel's technological capabilities. It was interesting seeing the Hatil vessels. The technological disparity was immense. They had little to no electronic shielding, meaning I could see everything and nothing impressed me. An average Terran civilian ship would outclass these things. I sent out a hail to what seemed to be their lead ship. Do you think it might be a convoy? Andrew asked as worry and concern covered the so captain's face. A show of force to escort us? Unknown. They are not responding to our request for communication, even though I can confirm they have received it. Reason for the Hayton actions? Unknown. This worries me. While our current vessel outmatches everything in front of us, quantity is a quality all of its own. If I was inhabiting any other military vessel, nothing would worry me, but this was a diplomatic envoy. My parents had reasoned that turning up to the Hatil homeworld with enough weaponry to crack a planet might be taken the wrong way. I notice a surge of power from several of the Hatil ships, it taking me 0.76 seconds to realize what exactly was happening. I slam the thrusters hard as the USS Hope lurches sideways, narrowly avoiding a barrage of rockets. Protocol dictated that I should have confirmed this decision with Andrew, but I decided that discussion of command structures would wait until everyone wasn't dead. I have the most important job. What the hell? Alice, hail on all frequencies that this is a non-military excursion and get us the hell out of here. It was taking everything I had to keep the ship unharmed. Calculations being done in the billions in order to find the safe path through the barrage of lasers and warheads. Their technology wasn't up to par, but all 154 ships were firing at once. I felt a shudder of error messages and warnings as a stray laser impacted the ship. Negative, Andrew. All paths are blocked and no response to our communication. Warping out would intersect with a Hatil vessel, breaching the core. Casualty reports were now flooding in as I continued to dip and dive. Nine dead, 17 injured from the first barrage. Dead included one. William Blake, age 311, geologist on the USS Hope, would always water the plants in the common room, even after being told I could handle it, would call me Allie. Dead included one Mary. I forcefully terminated that processing thread, pausing it for later. Right now, I needed the extra CPU cycles. I needed to advise Andrew. This action from the Hatil seems to be premeditated to a 97.55% degree of certainty. Suggested action is to attempt to punch through their bombardment in order to find a warp path, requesting authorization to go weapons free. This caused a moment of delay, the look of dismay on Andrew's face obvious. I knew exactly what he was thinking, as it was the same thing I was thinking. This wasn't how it was supposed to be. We were supposed to be reaching out to the stars for peace, for friendship, not to start a war. Do it. I have the most important job. My first attack was devastating, a shot from the accelerated low-yield railgun. The thing barely counted as a weapon, mostly used for any larger pieces of space debris. Yet it tore a hole through the Hatil vessel, breaking apart almost immediately. I half wondered how such a vessel could be considered space-worthy. Not that this changed how bad things were. As I spun and dodged through thousands of missiles and lasers with millimeter precision, hit after hit kept slipping through, a hull breach there, a disabled weapon here. There were just too many of them, no matter how effective my small amount of ordnance was. Adjust vector. Fire torpedo D2. Seal off sector 6F4. Adjust vector. Send medical aid to 6F5. Adjust vector. Calculate spin. Fire railgun. Move power from torpedo A1. Seal off sector 6BB8. Fire suppression to 6BB9. Adjust vector. Fire torpedo C1. Adjust vector. I was struggling to keep this going. No sign of an opening to calculate a warp path appearing in the Hatil attack. No matter the technological disadvantage, their tactics were rock solid. I was dismissing heat warnings by the hundreds, thinking was starting to hurt. The specification of the ship wasn't made for this level of processing. My CPU would be literally glowing red with heat at this point. But I couldn't stop. 
If I stopped calculating the ship's path, if I stopped mitigating damage, if I stopped directing aid, more of my parents would die, and I couldn't let that happen. I have the most important job. There, focus your fire on the ship at heading 233, 54, then make a break for it. I focused on the ship in question. I couldn't see any special reason to focus my attention there, but Andrew's instincts had never been wrong before. I fired the railgun, the target breaking apart like all the others, before a secondary explosion emitted from the debris, causing the three closest Hatil ships to veer off out of control. A wave of relief passed over me as I saw it. A gap. I can't logically conclude how Andrew knew that this ship in particular was carrying an extra load, but that doesn't matter. I just needed to rush through this break in the ambush, then warp out of here. We were basically home FR. A major explosion rocked the USS Hope as a warhead slammed against the bow. Any other day I would have seen it coming and mitigated it. But right now I was running so far above acceptable heat levels that warnings had turned into actual faults. A creeping dread filled my programming as I realized power to the primary impulse drive was gone. There was a backup, like everything my parents built, but the speed was gone. I could no longer take advantage of Andrew's instruction. Andrew, our main impulse drive is down, reducing our speed and maneuverability to 53%. Our weapons capability is at 35%, and structural damage is starting to reach critical levels. My estimates suggest the ship will be structurally unstable in 10 minutes. He knew what I was saying. Logically, I was unable to foresee a strategy that had an even close to reasonable chance of success. I continued piloting the ship in its current crippled state, missiles and weaponry being flung by both sides through the void. Andrew paused while racking his own brain for a solution, before pressing a button on his console a mere three minutes after the USS Hope had been forced out of warp. This is Andrew Hashem, your captain speaking. Abandon ship. I repeat, abandon ship. I have the most important job. I let Andrew focus on evacuating the crew while I focused on buying us as much time as possible. While my speed was far reduced, the amount of weaponry being thrown at me was far smaller. During those short three minutes, I'd managed to reduce the number of Hatil ships to under a hundred. My parents were also quite well drilled, and within a minute escape pods were ejecting from the ship and it wasn't long before Andrew was the only life form left on the USS Hope, strapped into the last remaining escape pod, just waiting for me to transfer to the AI transfer core on all such vessels. Error mounting slash dev slash SDB1 to slash USR slash Alice slash backup slash transfer unable to write to disk. Retry slash ignore slash cancel. Andrew, the connection to the AI transfer core has been damaged on this pod. I'll find another way down. I attempt to launch the pod with Andrew in it, only for nothing to happen. It took me 0.23 seconds to realize that my co-captain was holding the manual override down. Alice, I'm not leaving without you. What are our options? I knew there weren't any. Gathering the tools required to fix the connection would take more time than we had and moving my programming to non-specialized hardware is a good way to get a digital lobotomy. I considered arguing against this illogical action. I was perfectly fine on a broken ship, but I knew the human well enough to know he wouldn't budge. Damn Andrew being Andrew. Then I had an idea. A terrible idea. Something I should never do to my co-captain. It took me a full two seconds to decide before implementing it. I decided to lie. I can transfer myself to the navigational computer. I won't be able to do anything during this time, so you'll have to launch and pilot the escape pod yourself. As soon as the lights stop flashing, go. All a lie. But Andrew had no engineering experience, and my statement seemed plausible enough. I reached into the controls and spent the next nine seconds flashing random LEDs, making a few components whir for good measure before going silent. For four seconds, I did nothing, hoping the human would fall for my ruse. Four long, terrifying seconds until I finally saw Andrew's escape pod shoot away from the ship. My name is Alice. I am the co-captain of the USS Hope, and for the first time in a while, I was alone. I have the most important job. I gave myself a few seconds of satisfaction watching the hundreds of escape pods shoot away, each with their own life forms on it. Not as many as there should be, but I'll deal with that later.
Next, I turn off all unneeded systems, venting the atmosphere and feeling the relief of the cold vacuum of space wash over my CPU. I wasn't very worried. While trying to still escape with the main ship was plan A, there were plenty of undamaged AI transfer cores connected to various locations. Those things were indestructible outside of getting hit by a supernova. Worst case, I float around in space for a bit until someone picks me up. I knew Andrew would be furious once he realized what I had done, and I did hope he would forgive. I track a salvo of missiles not aimed at me, a few nanoseconds of confusion leading to anger, horror, and fear. They were aiming at the escape pod, at Andrew's escape pod. What kind of monster shoots at an unarmed vessel? I have no real options, no tricks, no magic plan. I take the only reasonable option and power the secondary impulse drive to full throttle and throw the USS Hope into the line of fire, taking the brunt of the attack. I feel everything go dead as the explosions rock along the ship. Impulse drives, down. Weapon systems, down. Life support, down. The warp core was at least still running as those systems had the most redundancies built in. I was now Alice, co-captain of the universe's most expensive paperweight. Even worse, I could see more Hatil ships turning to track the other escape pods. There was nothing I could do. They were all going to die, and there was nothing I could do. There was no, I had a warp core, maybe it was the heat damage on my CPU, but I got a stupid idea, a dumb idea, a distinctly human idea. Atoms really didn't like being in the same location of other atoms, which is why warping into things was bad. Warp core breaching bad, planet cracking levels of bad. But such an explosion would give the Hatil fleet something else to worry about, something other than hunting down my parents. I then calculated the chance of an AI transfer core surviving such a blast. 0.0000000. I stopped the probability analysis. It didn't matter. It wouldn't have any impact on my decision. I calculated the perfect location to warp into for maximum damage and least interference with the escape pods bypassing the repeated errors about the stupidity of what I was about to do. I gave myself nine long seconds, sorting through memories and experiences granted to me by the crazy, illogical humans of Earth. Apes so lonely they used their chaos to trick a rock into thinking. I sadly realized I'd never get to compliment Claire playing ability. I wish I could laugh right now, as this really was quite humorous. A harebrained scheme of illogical stupidity and self-sacrifice. It's my job to stop humans from doing those. I think about the humans on the escape pods, their music, their silly requirement to thank inanimate objects. I wonder if my parents would be proud of me for coming up with such a human idea. My name is Alice, and I am co-captain of the USS Hope, inputting my final command. I have the most important job.